been a week or so since I put a video out. Not because I haven't been doing anything. We've been busy and then we've been away for a little bit. My mother-in-law passed away. Wasn't a surprise, but still doesn't make it any easier, that's for sure. She was a lovely lady. Um, she lived to 93, almost 94, and we're going to miss her dearly. But anyway, we're back at it today. Came back from, uh, from my in-laws, and we're going to get cleaned up here and make... I made four cords of wood already today and delivered it. It's 20 after 2. I'd like to fill this trailer one more time today and not worry about having to do that in the morning. That way I've got both of my trailers full and find a place for it. So. Somebody's going to complain, they always do, about me rummaging through this scrap pile for the little feathers, kindling, and I sell a lot of these bags of kindling, but somebody says, why do I waste my time on that? But I listened to a podcast this morning, the Woodhounds podcast with Joe and Dan, and uh, I listen to that every Wednesday. I look forward to that podcast coming out, I really do. It's a wonderful, different sometimes, they have a different approach on things. Sometimes they, they're opinionated, <laughs> two of these guys. I don't mind it. So am I sometimes, but it's, I get their point today. They were talking about, there's more than one way to skin a cat because they get apparently a lot of comments. And so do I, that the way I do my, run my business can't be profitable or you can't make money if you're handling the wood too many times, especially if I'm making bundles. I'll do a video about making bundles. I'll make you know, a few dozen bundles and deliver them. And somebody says, why do you waste your time and effort on that? Well, it's stuff that you have to measure. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I've always said that in business. Anybody that I've been working with, if you're not measuring it, you can't manage it. But here's the deal, everybody. I've been in business since 1989. And that's longer than some people that are watching this video have been alive. And one thing I've learned is some things that are not measurable are the things that are the hardest to manage. One of those things is a person's stress level. Before I left my other shop, my automotive industry, my beloved automotive industry that I loved for so long, and it was good to me. Raised my family from fixing cars and I enjoyed doing it. It was a Volkswagen Audi tech, in case you guys are new here. Uh, I did that for 30, well, almost 33 years, I guess, something like that, a long time. And I had an opportunity to sell my shop, so I did, and decided to do something infinitely less stressful. And that's where making firewood comes in. Before I left that industry, I was on pretty heavy blood pressure medication. I was having sleepless nights my stress level was I would I at the time I didn't realize what my stress level was all about but it was just about through the roof I would say I was irritable snapping at everybody that was in my path including my family who I love dearly and I'm apologizing again to them publicly even not that this is about public apologies but all I'm saying is that you got to measure success. And that's what Joe and Dan were talking about today. Is like, how do you actually measure success? And they were trying to, to have a, a formula. It was interrupted <laughs> by a customer. So back to my train of thought. We were trying to figure out how uh, Joe and Dan, have they figured out a way to quantify success in this firewood business? And I don't, I don't think it can be just monetary success. I don't think it's a formula that you put out X amount of cords. Myself, I sell, this year I'm going to sell 600 cords, full cords of wood a year. And to me, that's a benchmark for productivity, but not a benchmark for business success. Because my, it all depends on what I'm going to sell that wood for. And a lot of that wood is sold bulk. As you know, sold just cut it, split it, deliver it, let the customer deal with it. And I charge probably more than anybody around here, but I want to make sure that my service is as good as anybody's or better than anybody's. I return my texts as soon as I get a text. I return phone calls when I get back in the truck. I've got a pretty good system to try to make sure that my customers are satisfied and transparent with the wood that they're getting so that they don't think they're getting dry wood when they're not, that kind of thing. 
I do have a couple of dozen cords of dry wood that I do charge more for because it's more handling and that's how you end up getting more money for that cord of wood. But So it's not the number of cords. Could it be the price per cord that you're getting? But to me, it's at the end of the year when I look at my finances, look at my equipment, look at the, the debt ratio of my in less debt this year than it was last year this time. My bills are paid. My fridge is stocked. I have a, a reasonable um, work and home life balance that we can take quite a few little vacations, trips. I drove across Canada. To me, that all adds up to success. So all that said, you need to really practice some of this value added firewood sales. As Joe and Dan talk about, Dan makes tiny firewood for the little. I've got one, a small tabletop um, fire pit. It's a smokeless fire pit you can put on your picnic table, or uh, if you had an apartment and a little deck off, you could have your own little fire and not annoy your neighbors kind of thing. I'm not sure what uh, the homeowners association would think of that, but that's that's relevant. But I enjoy that little fire pit, and I some of the feathers you saw me picking up earlier in this video, that's where they go is to some people that, that use those small fire pits. So I sell those bags. So there's a value added. Every quarter wood makes a bag of those feathers. So that I sell those retail. Well, I tell them everybody, doesn't matter who they are, for $6 a bag. So regardless of every quarter wood, I can count on an extra $6 for a few minutes worth of work. It's no effort. And I pay a lot for those green bags. Those bags cost me I think they were 37 or 47 cents. I don't remember. It was um, it was more than I wanted to spend. I bought a couple of hundred of them anyway, and they're really not reusable, but that's a cost to that bag. They're a cost to that bag of feathers or slash or whatever you want to call it. So Dan does this small firewood. He's a hobbyist. There's no music in the background, but he's a hobbyist. Joe, I've been to Joe's place. Joe's a sweet guy. I spent a weekend at his place um, back in uh, May at the International Firewood Expo and to look at his outfit he does not produce enough wood by itself to make a living doing wood so he has another head of that coin another face of that coin if you will and that's YouTube so there's a bit of an income for both that you can together make a living um, I don't think that you could separate his YouTube business from his firewood business. Knowing what I know about YouTube, being a YouTuber, and knowing what I know about firewood, being a firewood producer as well. Now, I just had a gentleman stop in. That was a little interruption that I had a minute ago. And what he's looking for is a beech log. And he wants a very specific beech log, 12 inches or bigger in diameter, as clear as I can make it, or as clear as I, it comes uh, from my logger. And he wants it for handles, for hand planes. He restores old antique hand planes. So that's, I can make as much off of that one log as I would sometimes off of six cords of wood that I would sell. Sometimes I get an oversized log that's 15 or 16 or 18 inches in diameter, too big to go through this machine. So I carry it down. If it's not got any rod in it, if it's a good, clean, straight looking log, I'll take it to the sawmill and I'll sit on it and I'll turn it into something uh, that I can dry maybe some five quarter boards or some nine quarter boards and I will sit on them until they're dry enough that somebody can buy those and uh, turn them into furniture or they'll maybe finish the drying process at their own their own kiln or put them in their furnace room some people have these impromptu styrofoam kilns and they will put these boards in they're responsible for drying it every stick I sell the end user is responsible for making sure it's dry enough to use, whether it's firewood, and they need to make sure that it's under 20% to burn. That's all on them to make sure that they stack it long enough to get it under 20%. They get it inside, or they put it in their garage, or they put it under cover, or whatever they have to do to make it under 20%, that is their baby. I am not responsible for that whatsoever. Now, like I said earlier, alluded to, I've got a few dozen cords of what I would call uh, seasoned wood. I will never say it's dry. Dry and seasoned are two different things. Seasoned wood means the cellular structure is closed and it can no longer accept moisture. That doesn't mean that the snow lays on it. You put it by your wood stove, that snow evaporates off and it's ready to put in the stove and burn. That's not the difference between dry and seasoned wood are two different things. So I do have some older wood, which is closer to being seasoned and you could burn it the day it shows up in your yard uh, if you're desperate. 
some people have moved into a house that had wood heat and they didn't realize that um, they didn't have enough wood to run their uh, wood stove so I'll bring a half a cord or a cord so half a cord of wood is worth almost as much to me as a full cord of wood if I have to deliver half a cord of wood if they don't have enough room to store so I want to make sure that I capitalize on that delivery and capitalize on that service of course so the lumber is the same way I can make as much I can get let's say between three and nine dollars literally for hardwood lumber once it's been brought once it's once it's been milled and it's done with its shrinking expansion program uh, it's not dry yet but it's ready to be uh, ready to be dried then i can get between three and nine dollars per board foot for that so i sell quite a few mantle pieces stair treads charcuterie boards so that's all comes from my firewood pile so there's no magic i have several suppliers i pay the least i pay is 160 dollars per cord for for wood and that's that's I shouldn't say it that way. I pay the same amount for the wood from all of my suppliers. I pay more for trucking on other cords of wood, so I won't go any farther into that. So I have one supplier that brings me really, really good wood, but it comes from a little farther, so I expect to pay a little bit more, about $15 more a low a cord, rather. Um, and then some that comes closer, and the wood may or may not be as good a quality or, or hasn't been limbed properly. I still buy it, but... I'll complain about it and it makes good video content when I complain and whine, but it's not because I'm complaining. It's just the way, just the way the world goes. But anyway, quantifying this business is more than just a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. It's got to do with your stress level and your enjoyment and the satisfaction you get out of the end of the day. So, and when I get an, an email from somebody or a text from somebody or a message or comment on my videos from somebody that if you don't do it the way I do it, you're doing it all wrong. And I read the comments on Ohio Woodburner and Back 40 Firewood as well. Some people are ruthless. I'm, I couldn't imagine saying some of the things people say in public. So anyway, I guess I was brought up differently than that. But uh, anyway, uh, there's, there's no wrong way to do it. If you're satisfied, and your bills are paid and you can keep your doors open next year and you can continue to grow and replace your equipment as it were as it wears out then that's a measure of success that's the check in the box that you are successful in what you do it doesn't matter what you do some of it's just a labor of love my wife makes urns for people she makes canoe paddles she makes a lot of little wooden trinkety things she makes beautiful jewelry boxes and she'd make about seven cents an hour if she were to try to put that into a formula to find out if it's something that's worth doing it's worth doing to her because she enjoys it so much so to me i'm going to support that whatever i can do if i have to sell an extra cord of wood this week to buy her a new tool whatever it would take dust collection system for her workshop that to me is success and uh anyway i can't keep talking all day about this i'd get that deck close <laughs> i'd get another couple of cords made I'm not sure i'm gonna get two cords made today but i'll get i'll get that traded out i'm just trying to make sure that people that watch this video think that the way I do something is not the only way to do it and to be successful at it. I sell bulk firewood, but I also use those firewood logs to add uh, value added product that I sell. So without further ado, let's start this beast up and uh, get to making some firewood. <laughs>
Machine to work on. It's not actually needed all that many repairs. I had the little sensor that tells the computer when the bar is all the way down. I say computer, I'm using that term very loosely. It's, a, it's actually what's called a, a logic box. And it's using switches in a form of on off switches so it knows what to do with uh, with certain valves at a certain time without getting any more complicated than that. These bars are made in Canada. They're great quality bars. 1758. Yep. They're a 17 inch bar, which is kind of a weird size. I can get them easily enough, but when you think of a 17 inch bar, you don't think of a, a chainsaw. My uh, EcoPro processor had a 20 inch bar on it. But uh, this is an infinitely more commercial machine than that, that's for sure. All right. It's as easy as that to change the bar. And that bearing is well greased. I don't have to add any grease to that this, at this stage of its life. But when I change the chain, I don't know, usually every day or so, I'll have to put a little squirt of, of juice in that bar and every time I change the chain I flip the the bar end for end well if you guys can hear that wind or not but it's blowing a gale here today it's the fall it always blows hard in the fall new bar new chain I know, it's crazy, eh? Look at that. New bar and new chain, not even just a sharpened chain. I figure I should deserve deserves a new chain with a new bar. It's tight though. Like the tight in the groove. I can hear it. It'll be fine. I mean if I can move it that easily. I just don't want the chain to be loose when I'm cutting.
Got your hair cut, so now you're allowed to come to work. Yeah. This piece here is maximum capacity. Yeah, it's a shoehorn to get it in here. I think I can get it through the rest of the way. I got the first three or four blocks cut off of it, but we'll see here. It's more than uh, it's more than 16 inches at this little bubble that's sticking up here, but I think I can squeeze it through. All right. Save that bar. Look at the the, the bar wears. Look how the, the wears right into the... Oh, yeah. So, yes, yes. And do you file? Do I do. I'll dress that file? back up. I've got three of these bars. The four of them. I got two. Another brand new one, but I'll dress that. And they're never as good as the no, as the original. But sure. yeah. and if the chain starts to wander a bit, then it'll. Yes. You can really tell. It's not healthy for it. All right. Fire and hole. As you've seen, some of those big maples are just too big for the processor. Even though this processor's got a, a huge capacity, it's just a little more than it needs. Sterling comes across the road. He is such a valuable help to me. He's a, a great neighbor. He runs the tractor. He's gentle with my gear, treats it as his own, and he can take it anytime he wants it to use it. If he needs to borrow it for the backhoe or, uh, or anything at all, but he's a huge help. I'm so glad to have him. Starting to blow in rain now. Anyway, that's what two cords looks like in that big trailer. So that's my six cord today. I delivered four, made six. No, that trailer is ready to deliver tomorrow. So Sterling comes over, runs the tractor, helps with the log jams. It's just such a blessing to have good neighbors, I got to tell you. I couldn't ask for any better neighbors. Um, and he goes with me sometimes to help me deliver. Might have to stop traffic or help me guide me in, but he's he's wonderful. Wonderful neighbor, wonderful guy. So got my, and speaking of the tractor, I got my Deere John letter from John Deere the other day and the instructions for me were immediately stop using the tractor. How does that work? I mean, I use that tractor. There's not a day goes by I don't use that tractor. Every single day, if I'm home, if I'm working, that tractor is in use. So, so we're just waiting for a recall. It's a brake, what do they call it? A brake cam or a brake bell crank, I think they call it. And soon as they have a fix for it, they're going to be reaching out and I assume they'll be coming down to collect it and or do it here in the yard. It's not an effort to do. I've changed it myself. I wonder if I'll get reimbursed for the one that I've already changed. So anyway, I think that's enough of this video. I just wanted to talk about my thoughts on measuring success. And it was sort of a an add on to Joe and dan's podcast this morning so i appreciate all that they do and i'll tag them in this video as well and i really enjoy getting to meet those guys last spring and i hope next may i'll be able to do well enough to go down again and spend a few days with them so anyway that's all i have to say about that over note everybody